In the, the 14 years of, of marriage um, to my, my wife, we've lived in four different states. Uh, we've lived in seven different homes or uh, apartments. Um, I've had a half a dozen jobs or so. We started a business together. We started this church together. Um, we have um, sinned against each other thousands of times. We've kissed each other uh, thousands of times. Um, we have um, uh, gone to, um, we've had a lot of extended family issues. We've had a lot of problems. Um, we've also visited, in the good uh, sense of this, Barcelona, Jamaica, Italy, France, Vail, Cancun. One time I rented the worst possible place ever on Possum Kingdom Lake. Um, that didn't go well. It was gross. Um, we have watched four seasons of The Bachelor together. Um, we repented. And we have watched, like a good Christian should, we, we have watched four seasons of Parenthood together, and we've cried through all of it. Um, no spoilers, we're a little behind, right? Um, we're going to start covering This Is Us in like 2030. Okay, we've got to finish Parenthood first. Um, we've watched Parenthood together. We've gone on about 500 dates together in our 14 years. Marriage for us has been unbelievably exciting, unbelievably ordinary, unbelievably mundane, and yet a never-ending adventure, and it's only been 14 years. Right? Marriage is um, a, a, a seasonal. You just go through these different seasons of marriage, and much of marriage is these seasonal changes, and how do we navigate from um, winter to spring? Right? Sometimes marriage is in winter where things are really hard. Um, there, there's some distance. You feel like you're in a rut. Um, maybe there's some, uh, a season of depression. Maybe there's seasons of, of great conflict. Maybe we're just trying to figure out parenting or there's financial stresses. Just like life, marriage has these different seasons. And sometimes we find ourselves in the, the season of winter. And what we see in the song this morning is that this husband leads his marriage and leads his wife out of the season of winter and into the pleasure pleasures and joys and intimacy of spring. That's what we're going to see this morning. And, and, and this man, fellas, this man is an absolute stud. If he has any insecurities, we don't hear of them. We, we don't hear of them at all. He just comes after his bride. He takes responsibility for their marriage and pursues her in the dead of winter. He doesn't pout. He doesn't distance himself from her. He just comes after her. And so, I mean, we've been saying this all along. This song is a song. It's not a story. So we don't get all the, the specifics. We don't get the context of what's going on in the marriage and, and what's wrong or anything like that. All we know is that this man leads his marriage out of winter and into spring in a way that only a man who knows who he is in Jesus can do. That, that's what we know. That's what we're going to see this Morning. So if there's anything that I would want the men of this church to take from this sermon, it's this, okay? Like, this is what I want you to hear. You are this man. You are capable of what this man is capable of, right? You are already this man. And it doesn't even have to be about marriage, right? This could be about anything. What makes this man capable to lead his, his bride out of winter and into spring is the same thing that, 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 that can make you capable of leading this church out of winter into spring or this city out of winter into spring or your life or, or whatever it is out of winter into spring. You have this ability. You have this strength. You have the spirit of God in you, men. And I have no doubt, no doubt the, the, the wisdom and character and nature and strength of the men at the Paradox Church, no doubt. And so you need to hear this, that you are this man, right? This is every man wrestling through every marriage, um, leading his bride out of winter and into spring. I, I need the men to hear this, husbands or, and single men. You need to know what you're capable of. You need to know that. The heart and soul of men has been ripped out over the last 50 years by the world and even by teachings in the church. We, we drugged a whole generation of young boys because they couldn't sit still. We gave them models uh, like Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin and Napoleon Dynamite and Judd Apatow movies, right? All of them, they're all the same. Uh, of these weak men that don't take responsibility because the romantic, idealized version of masculinity um, that was the alternative was impossible for us. Who, who of us is going to be William Wallace? 
right? We can't live up to Braveheart. So if we can resonate with the silly guy, I can do that. And I can be Napoleon Dynamite. I can't be William Wallace. And that's what we were, we were given as alternatives and options. Um, great African-American uh, sociologist and professor, Christian Anthony Bradley, he says this uh, uh, about this generation of men. He says, the world that nurtured millennial and Gen Z men is that of exaggerated and romanticized versions of masculine success aimed at winning the validation and affirmation of others. In this perfectionistic world, you never measure up, which forces you to think that there's something ontologically wrong with you. Toxic shame, then, leads men to self-assess as pathetic, weak, worthless, stupid, cowardly, foolish, inadequate, insufficient, or never good enough. Many of you have heard those literal words, those actual words spoken to you. And so then what we did, a whole generation of men got addicted to pornography and video games as a way to escape that toxic shame. Nobody told us that the gospel of Jesus takes away shame. And so we escaped into this fantasy world where girls do like us and where we can conquer something. We can be William Wallace because um, we were told that we weren't. And then in the church, instead of ministering to those group of men, Covered in that shame, the good news of a Jesus who takes away shame, all we did is made accountability groups. Hey, get into accountability groups and confess how horrible you are. Men are just filled with lust. They can't do anything about it. So maybe if we can get them in a room together and they can confess those things to one another, then that would be the answer. And I'm not saying accountability groups are, are wrong. I'm just saying it's not the answer. I won't look this time. Thanks for confessing that, brother. And then when you take the Me Too kind of movement that's going on right now where there's stories of sexual assault and sexual abuse perpetuated um, uh, by, by the, the, the men and we're telling those stories and we should tell those stories and we should be unbelievably angry at those stories, but you combine that kind of idea, that movement with the, this social media shame culture and this idea that, 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 that men are kind of all lumped into the same bucket, then all men are either um, powerful power hungry, lust filled monsters, or weak, flaccid, um, not masculine enough men. And we're reshamed and reshamed and reshamed and told how horrible we are. And then you come into the church because maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe if the world beats us up, maybe the church can be a refuge for us. And, and then all we had was pastors berating the same men for their addictions for their escapes from shame. They got yelled at because they were addicted to porn. They got um, yelled at because of their sexual addictions or their um, inability to take or unwillingness to take responsibility. And they were told to man up. And they did this without a drop of compassion, without a drop of empathy that said, and I know that shame too, and, and there's a Jesus that takes away shame. Let's, let's walk through that together. It was just pastors and church leaders who had their own daddy issues and their own shame issues, but didn't know what to do with them. And so they just figured, hey, let's all man up together. I've done this. I've done this in this church. Not knowing my own insecurities, not, not understanding my own shame and what to do with it and just thinking, well, we've got to figure this thing out, man. Let's go. Life's hard, marriage is hard, let's figure it out. Let's man up. What we need is pastors and ministry leaders and, and men in this church that, that have somewhat of an understanding of their shame and insecurities. Man, we're, we're, we're still men, we're still stupid when it comes to some of that, you know, emotional IQ. Like we, we, gotta, we gotta work hard on it. We gotta try to figure it out because our heart and soul has been ripped out and Jesus is beginning to put that together. But even if we just acknowledge that there's some of that in us and then we walk together towards a restoration in Jesus to biblical manhood, maybe that can be an encouragement to us. Maybe if the, the guy standing on stage here could encourage us us and, and, and who we are in Christ, maybe that could be a first step towards healing, towards strength, towards being reminded of who we already are in the gospel. 
I don't need to tell you to man up. You are a man. You're a man made by Jesus and restored by Jesus. And so listen to me, the problem with men and men, the problem with you is not that you're weak, pathetic, insufficient, unable. The problem is you don't know who you are. The problem is that you don't know how how able you actually are. You don't know how wise you are. You don't know how influential you can be. You don't know what capacity you actually do have in Christ, empowered by the Spirit. That's the problem, is we've forgotten who we are. We've just been ashamed of what we've done. And so your problem as a man and as a husband is not that you're not a man. Your problem as a man and as a husband is that you have sin and shame. And there's good news. Jesus takes away sin and shame. That's what we get to talk about. That's what we should focus on. Yeah, we should take responsibility. We do need to own it. We do need to take responsibility for the choices and the decisions that we make. We, we are responsible for what we do when we wake up tomorrow morning. But we also need to be reminded of who we are. I want to remind you of who you are. I want to look at this song. I want to see how he sings her out of winter and into spring. I want to see if we can learn some things from that, and then we'll, we'll talk at the end about what this could mean for us. All right? All right, Song of Songs, chapter 2. Song of Songs, chapter 2. Um, let, let's just look at verse 8 and verse 9 and, and chat a little bit more. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. The husband is pursuing his bride here, right? She sees him coming and he's, he's leaping and bounding, right? Brother's not playing it cool at all, right? He's not just, he's not walking towards his girl. He's not strutting, right? He's not even, he's not even like a slow jog, right? He's leaping and bounding, right? This is excitement and enthusiasm and eagerness. I mean, he's coming after her, right? He's coming after her and he's going to love this gal. He's going to woo this gal um, out of whatever funk she's in, right? Whatever funk the marriage is in, whatever funk the, the intimacy is in, whatever's going on in the marriage, he's going to woo her out of it, right? He's going to call her out of it and nothing will stop him, right? He's leaping over mountains and bounding over hills, Right? Nothing will stop him. He's like, oh, there's a mountain. I'll just jump over it. All right? I'll just jump over it. Uh, there's a long illness. I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray and I'm going to plead with the Lord to deliver this, us out of this. Oh, there's, there's bad conflict in our marriage. And we're just following. We're in this rut. I'm going to own my stuff. I'm going to be patient and gentle and, and sweet. I'm going to lead us out of winter and into spring. It doesn't matter the obstacle. It doesn't matter what's in our way. I am going to pursue my bride. Nothing We'll stop them. Husbands, do you remember when nothing would stop you to be with your girl? You remember that? You'd drive all night to see her. You would, you'd leave work early to go see her even if you had a bunch of work to do. You, you, would, you would not hang out with your dudes because you wanted to hang out with her. You were that guy, right? Where'd Jim go? He's with Heather again. Dang, dang. Do you remember those days when you would do anything for your wife, for your girl, for your marriage? That's what he's doing here. And the reason why that's already in you, the reason why you did it then, and and, and we can talk about why maybe you're not doing it now, but the reason why you did that then is because you were made um, in the image and glory of Jesus. You are... Um, uh, the, the image and glory of God, right? Jesus pursues his bride at all costs, doesn't he? Right? Nothing would stop Jesus to come and rescue his bride, the church, and to lead her out of winter and into spring. Nothing would stop. There's no obstacle too big, right? Not death, not the grave, not your sin. Jesus was coming after um, his bride, the church, and you, husband, are an image of Jesus to your bride, your wife. And so leaping and bounding 
is the husband towards his girl. When you leap and bound to your girl, especially when it's hard, especially when it's winter, you are, you are, you, there's nothing more manly or godly that you can do. Nothing more manly, nothing more godly than you can do to lead out of winter and into spring. And then in verse nine, um, she, she's like, she's like, like she sees him come and she says, she says, look at this stud, right? Call, she calls him a young stag, right? Wives, your husband could live um, for three months off of you calling him a young stag. He wouldn't need water or food or anything. Seriously, <laughs> legit. Call him a young stag, put a bunch of things on his shoulders. He would do anything, right? He could handle any, he would be Braveheart if you called him um, a, a young stag. Now that's amazing. She calls him a, a young stag and then, and she sees him coming and then it looks like he's stalking her, right? Gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. He's not stalking, it looks shady, but it's not. This is his bride, right? This is his wife. He's not stalking her. Here's what's happening. Throughout the song, there, there, there's this constant playfulness and invitation and, and pursuit of the husband to the wife and even the wife to the, the husband. That's what's happening. He's, he's leaping over mountains and bounding over hills and then he stops at her door and he woos her out. He invites her out, right? He's not gonna demand um, his own way. He's not gonna insist on his own way. He's not gonna grab her and say, baby, we're done with this. We're going into spring. Figure it out. Let's go. No, no, no. He's, he's going to woo her. He's going to invite her. He's going to call her um, to himself and, and, and out of winter and into spring. He's being gentle and tender. He's doting here. He's entreating um, uh, this, this gal. The, the, the song, when it does this, it's, it's like a gospel song. It's call and response. Right? The husband calls the wife and she responds, or the wife calls the husband and he responds. It's this, this, this invitation into a song together, into a harmony, and that's what he's doing. He has done whatever he could to get to the house. Now he's inviting her out. Um, if you remember the, the, the gal, and we'll, we'll be reminded of it again here in a few verses, but our bride, our, our wife, is, 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 is a dove, right? Her eyes are like doves. She's like a lily, we don't stomp on lilies. We don't shout at doves. We, we woo them. We, we're gentle with them. We're tender with them. And that's what he's doing here as he looks through the window and calls her out. And now, now we're going to see him speak. Look at verse 10. He, here he begins to call her. She says, my beloved speaks. And here's what he says to me. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. This is an invitation out of winter and into spring. He's saying, winter's over, baby. Winter's over, right? The 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 rains are gone, the flowers are blooming, the vines are ripening, the fruit is bearing. It's not winter anymore. Let's, let's wake this marriage up. Let's bring this marriage into spring. Here, I'm going to lead us. Let's go. Right, let's go. Spring is a universal metaphor for love and intimacy, right? Um, uh, animals, they mate in spring. I, I still can never forget the time when I was, I was younger and went to the Detroit Zoo with my family. And, and there, was, there was two tortoises that were going at it and making the most horrible noise ever that I can never unhear it. I can never unhear it. And I remember asking my mom, um, mom, what's happening right now? And I remember her telling me, it's springtime, honey. And that was it. And I remember just thinking, what does that have to do with two turtles fighting each other and yelling at one another? Like, what's, what's happening right now, right? It's springtime, right? It's mating season. It's intimacy. He's inviting them to renew their marriage and to, to be intimate and to, to, to come into the pleasures and joys of, of spring. And this is the exciting part about marriage. Yes, it's hard, husbands, but this is the exciting part, right? These different seasons. And we have the responsibility to lead our bride in our marriage out of the, the coldness or, or, or bitterness or, or, or dampness or distance of, of the, 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 the darkness of winter and into the vigor and freshness and joy of spring. It's easy to get caught up in the, the mundane of life, the mundane and ordinary of marriage, right? And we can kind of lose our, our leaping and bounding uh, vigor, 
And we stop pursuing and we stop coming after and we stop pursuing one another in, in this kind of love because the ordinary mundane of life and marriage gets in the way. And, and, and the obstacles begin to look too tall. And so we just kind of stop doing it. And so the, the joys of marriage then and the responsibility in particular of the husband is to in, in, infuse in the ordinary of marriage and in the, the mundane of life um, a, a, a springtime vigor. Right? What does it look like to see the, the ordinary mundane of life as not an obstacle to intimacy and oneness, but as an opportunity actually to build intimacy and oneness? Right? What does it look like to take the morning time? Like, like every day, the sun's going to come up and you're going to wake up. What does it look like to redeem that time to build intimacy? Right? If you're married at the Paradox Church, there should be no reason why most of the week you're getting up with your husband or with your wife and doing Par Par Paradox 365 uh, reading that morning together, a quiet time together. Right? Get up, make some coffee, hold hands while the coffee is brewing because I ain't talking in the morning. Let's not kid ourselves, right? I'm not, I'm not gonna talk, but I'll hold your hand. And we'll wait for the coffee to brew and then we'll go sit down and we'll open up our Bibles and we'll read them. And then when you're done and when I'm done, we'll, we'll pray together and then the kids will come down and things will go crazy, right? But that 15 minutes, how much joy and intimacy will be built? I promise you, Jesus probably won't show up the first morning you do it. You probably won't end up on the couch doing other things, right? That's probably not going to happen. Um, but over the days and the weeks and the months and the years, can you imagine what would be built just taking 15 minutes in the morning together like that? Right? That's ordinary. Infusing into the ordinary, fresh springtime, intimacy-building Things. What would it look like to do that? What does it look like to go on a walk together after dinner, to hold hands together in the kitchen, to dance, to kiss, to just take some of the, the ordinary stuff? Like, what does it look like to bring a gift home with you? Right? Instead of the ordinary, I'm home, how was your day? My day was fine, how was your day? My name is fine, it was great, fine, okay, great. Right? What if, what if, what if you brought a gift home, just broke up the monotony of coming home? My wife told me, she said, anytime you buy something in anthropology, it's going to be a good thing. <laughs> I was like, all right. Now I call it anthropology because everything is $77.45. <laughs> like you could buy a dish towel and it's 80 bucks. <laughs> but what does it look like to, to bring home a gift? What does it look like um, to, to get out of the mundane, right? What does it look like to get out of the ordinary of life? Um, what does it look like for date nights for you? Right? You may have to budget for it. You may not be able to go golfing or hunting because you've got to take that money and, 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 and allot it to date nights or babysitters or whatever. But what does that look like to get out of the mundane and ordinary sometimes so that we can pursue one another's hearts and, and joys and, and all of that and, and stay in springtime for as long as we can? Who wants winter? Let's stay in springtime. That's what he's doing here. He's leading her out of the mundane and the, the winters of marriage. And he's trying to, to get them out of this little rut and bring them into spring. And, and, and now in verse 14, we get a little insight into what winter can look like. Look at verse 14. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Um, if you remember, this is a song, not a story, so we don't get specifics, but what we see is that she's the dove, and now she's up on a cliff. She's in a crag, right? She's away from what most of the song sings of, the flourishing of the vineyard, the flourishing of the garden, right? The, the blooming and the, the watering of the, the fountains and all of that. Like that, most of the song sings of that. Now she's not there. Now she's on a cliff. She's in a crag. She's on the rocks. She's not in this place of flourishing. There's something going on with her. Maybe it's the exhaustion of young kids. Maybe this is the darkness of depression. Maybe this is the rut of, of just marital conflict, but something's happening here and the marriage is on a cliff and she is in the rocks hiding as a little dove. She's in winter and he's trying to invite her into spring. Let me see your face, baby. It's lovely. Let me hear your voice. It's sweet, right? He's leading her and wooing her and praying for her and calling her to come out 
that they might renew their intimacy and, 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 and revive their marriage. That's what he's saying here. And then in verse 15, there's some debate over who's singing it at this point or who's saying it at this point. Um, is she calling him to take the foxes or is he calling her to grab the foxes? It, it doesn't really matter. I think it's him. But, but uh, basically what's happening here is that there's foxes in the vineyards and they need to be caught. And the vineyard throughout the song is, is in general about the woman, right? The woman is the vineyard. It's her, it's her body usually um, more specifically and even her intimacy, her desires, her sexuality, if you want to get even more precise, that's the vineyard. And so the foxes are getting into the vineyard, she's saying, and he needs to catch them. Right? There's something that's hindering her, 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 her desires. There's something that's hindering her joy. There's something that's hindering their, their intimacy. And that's what the foxes um, are. It's anything that would, that would come into the vineyard when the grapes are ripening and eat the fruit, steal the fruit of the marriage. Anything that would hinder intimacy, it needs to be caught. We gotta get it. We gotta take it. We gotta catch it, men. That's what she is saying here. Um, in, in her really fascinating book, I'm not all the way done with it, but, but it's just really, really, really good. It's called The Female Brain. Um, it's by uh, Dr. Luanne Bri uh, Brizendine or whatever. Here's what she says. Listen to this. Female sexual turn-on Female sexual turn -on begins, ironically, with a brain turn-off. The impulses can rush uh, to the pleasure centers only if the uh, amygdala, the, the fear and anxiety center of the brain, has been deactivated. Any worry about work, the kids, schedules, dinner can interrupt the march toward pleasure. Right? The gals won't do it, but in their heart, they're saying amen. Okay? Saying amen. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> this is how God wired their brain. Okay? which this is one of the most profound differences between men and women, by the way, right? Because the kids could be screaming and pulling each other's hair out and the laundry could be piling up and bill collectors could be coming to the doors and, 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 and aliens could be invading earth and a husband could be like, baby? <laughs> now? <laughs> I'm ready, right? Uh, it, but, but women are different. Right? Women are different. And so anything like this, right? anything that's happening um, uh, it, it, that's going to give her anxiety, that's going to give her fear, and that's a, a lot of things, man, okay? That's a lot more than you might think. Um, it's gonna, if those things are active in her life, it's going to be hard for her pleasure centers to fire, for that desire to, 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 to be there. And so a husband has to work on relieving the fear and anxiety of his wife. The husband has to work hard at getting the foxes out of the, the, the vineyard, whatever that looks like. If that means taking the kids out, cooking dinner, um, uh, uh, if that means um, making sure the bills are paid, whatever it looks like, he's got to try to turn her brain off for her to be turned on, Okay. That's just a um, scientific reality of how God has made our gals. And so what does it look like? Where are the foxes in your marriage right now? What's hindering intimacy? What's hindering her desires and joys? And what's put her on the cliff or in the crags of the cliff? What, what is that? Is it conflict, unresolved conflict? Like it's just kind of underneath the surface. You guys haven't really gotten underneath like, um, real, you know, to the depth of what's happening here, but it just keeps coming up and you won't do anything about it. What does it look like to resolve that conflict? What does it look like? Do you need to go to, see, do you need to, go to counseling? Right? Go to counseling. Go to counseling before your marriage is on fire, please. Right? Don't, don't go when everything's just broken. Go when it starts to break, Okay. There's, there's no shame in that um, uh, for us. The Paradox Church, we, we talk about this all the time. It wasn't long ago, uh, a couple of years, where my wife and I had to call up Pastor Ryan and his wife and say, hey, will you come over? We, we got to work through some things, and we're in this little bit of a rut. Don't be afraid to go to counseling. You probably need to apply for redemption groups today. Right? I think even today is the deadline for redemption groups. And, 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 and you both apply, husband and wife, you don't just send the wife to, to redemption groups because she's in the winter. No, no, no. You're both in the winter, right? And you're going to, in your oneness, you're going to lead her out of winter and into spring through, the, through the, the beauty and depth and grace and glory of Jesus as you walk through redemption groups together. What does it look like? What does it look like for you to find the foxes, to catch the foxes and get them, get them out of the vineyard? One of the best ways to do this is to just keep short sin accounts in the marriage. 
Don't let things fester. Don't let things go on for days or for weeks. One of the things my, my wife and I um, have started to do is once or twice a week, we'll go through a marriage liturgy, right? A marriage liturgy where we'll sit on the bed and, and we'll just do this call and response, read through this call and response where, um, man, man, maybe there's something going on in my heart I was unaware of. And as we speak these words, it gives us space to do that. I'll, I'll put this marriage liturgy on our app tomorrow, um, but I want to give you a taste of it right now um, uh, just so you can get, just see a little bit. It's beautiful. So you'll start off as one together saying this, as we are unworthy players, O Lord, unworthy to portray your glory. We are weak, we are jealous, we are easily wounded, we are petty, we are embittered, we store up remembrances of wrongs, we are insecure, we hurt one another, we do not deal with our conflicts well, we fail to love as you have loved, forgive us even the failures of this day. And then we confess those things. And, and then the husband says, I am not strong enough in my own strength to be husband to you. And then she looks at him and says, and I am not strong enough in my own strength to be wife to you. And so then he leads them and says, let us then turn to God together, asking for the strength that we need. It's beautiful. Put these things into the rhythms and habits of the marriage and Man, maybe we can stay in spring a lot longer. Maybe we can get out of winter a lot quicker. That's what he's doing. The husband's pursuing and wooing and calling and leading her out of winter and into spring. And, and here's what happens. Look at verse 16. My beloved, she says, is mine and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadow flee. The shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. All his work bears fruit. It bears fruit. She says, my beloved is mine and I am his. This is one of the choruses of the song, one of the refrains of the, the, the song of songs. Three times it will be repeated. It's unbelievably important and it's unbelievably beautiful, this language, because it's covenant language. My beloved is mine and I am his. Right? This is mutual possession. This is, this is um, oneness. This is the two becoming one. This is literally the greatest sentence in the English language. Because this is the language of love. This is the language of the Bible. This is the language of God. This is Christianity in one sentence. My beloved is mine and I am his. It's Trinitarian language. It's the most beautiful sentence in the whole world, right? This is the language of marriage, of covenants, of love. Um, in the, the book of Hosea, God calls a spirit-filled stud of a man to marry a prostitute, right? Right? To add to it, her name was Gomer, okay? So prostitute, her name's Gomer. If your name's Gomer, I'm sorry. Um, it's a safe bet that you're not here, okay? <laughs> I just thought, I was like, what if, what if there's Gomer here? I don't know. And he says, I want you to marry Gomer. She's a prostitute. And, and I want you to leap and bound towards her even when she's unfaithful. And I want you to keep coming after her and he keep going after her even when she goes and sleeps with other men even when she's unfaithful to the marriage, because I want it to be a picture of my love for my people, the church. Because Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna love an unlovely people. He's gonna love an unfaithful people, right? You and me, unlovely, unfaithful, but God's gonna come after us anyway, leaping and bounding towards us in covenant love, right? And so he uses the language of covenant um, in, in Hosea 2. Here's what he says, Hosea 2, verse 16. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, no, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. You are my beloved and my beloved is mine. Whatever the problems or distance or conflict in the marriage, the husband pursues his wife and leads her out into this place of renewing the covenant in this safe and secure context of marriage. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. And she responds to him by giving herself to him. In verse 16, it says, he grazes among the lilies. This is um, sexual intimacy. They're, they're, they're renewing their covenant. They're having sex there. That's what that is. He grazes 
among the lilies. The, the metaphor changes from, from leaping and bounding over mountains. Now he's on the mountains in verse 17, right? That's, that's intimacy. That's, that's pretty great, actually. That's what he's doing. Sex for them is a renewing of their covenant. Sex is a covenant renewal ceremony. Husbands, wives, every time you are intimate with one another, you're renewing your vows. My beloved is mine and I am his. I am wholly giving and completely giving of myself to another. And he is wholly giving um, and completely giving of himself to me. And we're renewing our covenants, the tangible acting out of the supernatural and spiritual oneness that marriage provides. It's beautiful. And you probably thought you'd never hear this in a sentence in church, but it's true. Sex is a lot like communion, okay? Stay with me. <laughs> Sex is a lot like the Lord's Supper, where every week we come forward to take of the, the bread, which represents Christ's body, wholly and completely given to you. And we dip it into the wine, which represents um, his blood that was shed in love for you, completely and wholly given to you. We're remembering the covenant. We're, in a sense, renewing our covenant. We're reminding ourselves that we are God's people and he is our God. It doesn't matter what we did. It doesn't matter what winters we've walked in over the past few days or few weeks. It doesn't matter how you walked into this place and how cold you've been and distance you've been from God. When you drink of the wine and eat of the bread, you're remembering his grace that you are his. It renews the covenant. It's beautiful, isn't it? Remembering that you are God's and he is your God. It's a covenant renewal ceremony. It's sacred and supernatural and full of meaning and, and depth. The Apostle Paul, he, he said that when we eat of it, every time we do, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. Meaning that we come forward in the, the winter of life's sins and sufferings and sorrows and, and we eat and, and we drink and we remember that one day Jesus is going to come back and he's bringing spring with him. He's bringing restoration to our still shameful heart, man. He's bringing renewal. One day all will be made new. And when we eat and when we drink, we're remembering that. Husbands, wives, same thing. When you are, have sexual intimacy with one another, you're remembering and renewing the covenant. You're remembering your love for one another. You're remembering the days where you le were leaping and bounding. You, you're renewing that vigor and that strength and that passion of marriage in spring. People will ask the question just real practically, how often should a husband and a wife be intimate? What's healthy and and there's different, you know, things. and It kind of depends on how many kids you have, to, to, to be honest. But um, the, the biblical answer would be, how often do you need to renew your covenant with one another? How often do you need to be reminded of your love for one another? How often do you need to act out the supernatural and spiritual oneness with one another? That's how often. That's how often. That's why Christian marriages statistically have the, the best sex. Those that would pray together, go to church together, would serve in the church together, would give their money, would be committed to Jesus, would repent of sin, scientific, proven data that they have the best sex. It's a renewal of the covenant, and it's beautiful. And so he has led her now from winter into spring. He has pursued her and wooed her. He has caught the foxes that were hindering their intimacy, and he has called her out of the, off the cliff and into springtime. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty cool thing to see. Uh, fellas, listen to me. Here's what I want you to hear and what I want you to know. You are this man. You are the leaping and bounding one. You don't have to become this. You are this. At 1 Corinthians 11, you are the image and glory of Jesus. Do you understand that? Adam's sin was forgetting who he was and, and, and thinking, right, thinking that he was something else. And so he became what he wasn't. That was Adam's sin, forgetting who he was and becoming what he wasn't. That's our sin as well. We have forgotten who we are and we have become what we are not. 
But the message of the gospel is that Jesus has come, right? Jesus, as fully man, was tempted and tried in the same way, and in our place, did not forget who God was, did not forget who he was in, in, in relationship with that God, but that he is a son, the beloved son, filled with the spirit. And if you are in Christ, you too are the son um, filled with the spirit of God. Right? We can't forget who we are. You are the leaping and bounding one if you're in Christ. You have been filled and empowered by the spirit. You are a son of the most high God. And if you've forgotten that, your job today is to remember to remember who you are. That's what, what you need to do today. I don't have to tell you to be a man. You already are. This idea of manhood being some sort of archetypal, you know, a fantasy of whatever culture um, is, is, is present, presented in at the time is ridiculous, right? Like sports and hunting and crushing beer cans is what makes a man. That idea is stupid, Okay. What kind of low bar is that? You know how easy that is? You know how easy it is to go buy a gun and shoot something? That's, e that's low bar masculinity and anybody can do that. That's not manhood. You don't need to be told to be a man. You are a man and here's what men do. Men take responsibility. Men are generous. Men serve. Men lead their wives out of winter and into spring. Men die for other people. That's what men do. That's what you have been made, right? Men get up earlier in the morning than anyone else and they wake up and they read their Bible and they pray. They get on their knees and pray. That's the most manly thing you can do tomorrow. Right? The most manly thing you can do tomorrow is wake up early, open up your Bible, read two chapters, get on your knees and plead with the Lord to move mightily in your marriage, to move mightily in this church, to move mightily in this city. That's a man. You can do that. You were made to do that. You are that. You are the leaping and bounding one. And yes, life is hard and maybe you still have shame. I know I do too. I do too, right? The, the, the war has been won. Jesus has won the battle, but there's still um, shame and brokenness thrown about in the, the battlefields of our heart. And, and we've got to take the gospel every day to apply it to the aftermath of that war and put those pieces of our heart back together and be reminded all the more that, that there, there's no shame in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We have to keep doing that, but it's not supposed to be easy. And it wasn't promised that it would be easy. Life is hard. And marriage is hard and singleness is hard and church is hard and work is hard. It wasn't supposed to be easy. It wasn't supposed to be easy. You're not not a man because you can't figure this thing out yet. It was supposed to be hard. You're probably not killing it right now. It's hard. It's hard for women too. The, the curse in Genesis 3 was for men and women, for Adam and Eve. Um, but Jesus came and restored biblical manhood. He restored biblical womanhood too and praise God for that. Praise God for the fierce, godly, strong women at the Paradox Church. But listen, we don't ever have to um, um, push down men in order to elevate women. We don't have to do that, right? Church is big enough. The world is big enough for strong, godly women and strong, godly men. And I'll tell you what, when we start um, creating this gender sameness and no gender distinction, that idea that's happening in the culture, if it's brought into the church, will crush men. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We need to fight for what is still distinctly and uniquely man and what is uniquely and distinctly woman. We have to. And just the very idea of gender sameness or a lack of gender distinction is scientifically dumb. It's theologically dumb and it's experientially dumb. We know this. And so no, we can call our men to be men because they are men. And what they are called to is distinct and unique. And so whatever you think you are, whatever shame you still have, men, whatever whatever insecurities you still wrestle with, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus has already made you new. You are the leaping and bounding one even if you don't feel like it today. You are this strong. You do have this calling. 
Stop trying to be rich and famous and awesome. That's not your calling. That's not the standard. The standard isn't even to have, to, to have great sex or a great marriage. The standard of God is obedience and faithfulness to what he's called you to. And what he's called you to is to lead your wife out of winter and into spring. And while you're at it, lead this church out of winter and into spring. While you're at it, lead this city out of the winters of, of racial or, 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 or religious complacency, right? racial indifference, sexual brokenness, whatever's going on in the winters of this city, lead us out into the spring of, of revival and renewal. That's what we're called to. Let's go. Let's go. It will be hard, but you are capable. Jesus has made you this. It'll probably take you a long time. I don't know how up on a cliff your marriage is, how broken it is. I don't know how deep into the crags your wife is. I, I just don't know. I don't know how scared of a dove she is. This may take a long, long time. But listen, like let this affirm you. Let this be true in your heart. You've got to hear this. You were the man for her. You are the man that God gave her. Do you understand that? God in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty over all things gave you to his daughter. There is no other man for her. There is no other man that could lead her in the marriage out of whatever brokenness it's facing. You were the man that God gave her. You're the young stag. You're the leaping and bounding one. You're the spirit-filled, empowered by God, son of the most high God that was given to your bride. You were given to this church to love and lead her. You were given to the city to love and lead her. Why do you think God, did God make a mistake with you? You are this it doesn't matter what shame you've walked in. It doesn't matter what, what, what distortion your desires have. It doesn't matter what you've done. In Christ, you are the leaping and bounding one. So pick up your cross and die again. Pick up the bucket and wash her with the water of God's grace again. Pick up your pride and glorify God's name in this city again. Let's go to work. This is what we've been called to. You are this in the gospel. This is true for you.